to Psalm 144, we are somewhat uh, delayed in our pronounced schedule for today. But the presence of the Lord in healing here, we cannot defer what the present Spirit of God makes available for the heart. And I have felt strength and virtue go out of me today. And I have felt the healing flow. Have you felt the healing flow of the Lord today? How many of you have? Just manifest that by lifting up a hand to the Lord. Praise God. <clears throat> My text today will be, Rid Me of Strange Children. I'll begin with the first verse of Psalm 144. Rid me of strange children. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, he in whom I put trust, who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Man is like to vanity, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, and destroy them." And here David, to this point, is glorifying God, talking of His greatness and of His goodness. And then he prays for a, an awesome manifestation of God. He said, I want you to just bow the heavens down and touch the mountains until they smoke. And I want you to see the response that comes out of his spirit when he prays that prayer. A lot of times when we ask God to do something great and something mighty and something awful, awesome, when we ask God to do that, God makes manifest in our life something that causes that power to be restrained. How many of you understood that statement? You know, we'll pray, God, do a mighty thing through me. And then the Lord, in order to do it, has to reveal to us what in our lives has to be adjusted in order for him to do that. Okay? And I think that is what happens here in this passage. Cast forth lightning, scatter them, shoot out thine arrows and destroy them. Send out thine hand from above. And then he prays a very personal and strange prayer. Rid me and deliver me out of great waters, and when you read waters or great waters in a passage like this, it speaks of confusion or it speaks of a multiplicity of detail, conflagration. The waters were upon the face of the deep. Things were in a devastation. Waters can also speak of multitudes or many. In this situation, great waters speak of great consternation, great trouble. Deliver me out of great trouble, out of great waters from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Now I'm back to my text again. How many of you were here Thursday night? And last Sunday, we talked about the refuge of lies and falsehood being a hiding place in religion for the unconsecrated heart. I'm back again today in the same place. I'm trying to open you a room for prayer in your personal life. Help me today in the word of the Lord. David then says, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. And then you can see it again. He tries to worship. He comes back to the same theme. It's stuck in his spirit. He's got a problem. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children. He's already said that one time. He's saying it again. Whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand 
of falsehood. Now, Lord, we are your children and we are your servants. And we pray just now for very special understanding. We pray, Lord, that every heart will be touched by your word today. And we ask you to fulfill your cause and purpose in this service. For every weary soul, for every misunderstanding heart, for those whose minds are wandering, for those whose spirits are not in subjection to the word of the Lord, somehow bring us all to spiritual attention. I command every spirit of distraction to leave. I command every unclean and filthy spirit that will not submit to be gone in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I command every devil and every demon force that speaks against the consecration of the mind to the will of God to let go. I command you to give up in Jesus' name. Give up now. Man, let's be seated together, please. <clears throat> The word strange preceding the word children is the conjugation for my message to you today. The putting together of these two things creates the knowledge of a situation that we will compare spiritually to this prayer of David. Strange children. If he had said, deliver me from children, we understand that. He's praying that he won't have any youngins. But when he says, deliver me from strange children, he qualifies the progenity and makes it, in fact, exclusive to those children that are not familiar or to those children that are not righteously the same. He says, deliver me from strange children. Strange children. Let's first of all talk of things we know. Children, the Bible said, are the heritage of the Lord. The scripture teaches us that they are like arrows in a quiver. And blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The scripture says there actually is a blessing pronounced on large families in the Bible. Many children. And we live in an age, in a day where marriage and where family relationships often include the prevention of birth or birth control. And we are so busy in our society trying to teach other less understanding societies these same great methods so they won't have so many children. I'm not sure the world wasn't sweeter and a whole lot better and more wholesome when mamas and papas had all they could do to raise all they could to feed all their kids. I'm not sure that in an age where cats and dogs and cars take precedence over the rearing of your own flesh, life, and blood has not brought a curse to the society and a condemnation to the nation itself. <clears throat> I don't think that the love for a child should be poured out on a cat or that love for an offspring should be poured out on a dog. God intended that a human family bring forth children. As a matter of fact, under the Hebrew law, it was a curse for a woman married in the Hebrew family not to bear children. That's why Rachel prayed, give me children or I die. She actually felt she could not live if she didn't give life to children. What would the world be like without children? Can you imagine a world without children? I read a story the other day about a family that adopted a little baby, a little baby boy, 
And the reason for this adoption happened in a strange way. This mother and father had made up their mind they never wanted children. Their reason for not having children was they didn't want to have to have the responsibility of bringing up a kid in all of the terrible circumstances of the society they were living in. And the man was at a store in a market when he patted a little boy on the head and said, How are you, Sonny? And the little boy looked up and said, Fine. And the little boy asked him a question that stunned him. He said, Sir, where are your little boys? And he said, I don't have any. My wife and I don't want any children. And he said, the little boy answered him with a questioned look in his eyes and said, well, sir, who's going to look after you when you get old? And when he asked that question, the man went home and told his wife, we're going to have children. It was too late for them to have children in their lives, so they adopted a little baby boy to take care of them when they got old. Somehow love in the picture just destroys all the problems with a society, doesn't it? And that's the way it should be. Children are supposed to be the response and the result of love between a husband and a wife. That's what is supposed to be the producing force for children. Not just the act of an affair, not just bodies coming together, not just chemical or biological purposes working in force with nature, but it was the intention of God that Adam love his wife, that husbands love their wives, that wives love their husbands, and that the response and the result of that love relationship would be children. That was God's plan. And for those families who have in proper perspective the having and rearing of children, the responsibility of rearing children, the sometimes thankless task of provision of food and provision of clothing and for schooling and all that it entails, the school books and the paper and the pencils and the pens and the rulers and erasers and the tennis shoes and the blue jeans and the little skirts and bonnets and all the trappings that go with going to school. One of the little fellows outside the building here the other day met me and it was cold and he didn't have his jacket on. I said, where's your jacket? He said, I don't have it with me. And he said, I'm out of uniform too. <laughs> he was going to let me know right away that if I was going to find fault with his procedure, I, he was going to go ahead and tell me he knew the rest of it wasn't right as well. And so he gave me the whole story all at one time. I'm out of uniform too. All that goes with educating these children and rearing them up and then that tragic Space of time we call those teenage years where they grow so wise so quickly and where fathers and mothers lose mentality by the pound hour by hour until we have this gigantic generation gap and this enormous and hopeless chasm in understanding between these growing adolescents and these grown-up adults. And then finally, we just try our best to struggle through to graduation and pray for God to give us grace for college. And somewhere, someday, we hope that that love that we have given in misunderstanding and in lack of purpose in the child's mind gains understanding and gains purpose in their adult heart. And somewhere they come back to put their big rough arm around that withering chin and pull that gray head down upon their breast and say, Mama, I love you. Or Papa, you mean all the world to me. This would be a tragic world without love and without love making and without the production 
and without the rearing and maturing of children. That's God's plan. But there is in the body the ability to produce a child outside of the bonds of love. There is in the mind and in the spirit and in the emotion and the heart of man a wickedness that is bestial. There is the ability of a man to actually force his will upon a woman and without her acceptance or without her receiving or without her submission, he can actually force seed upon her and she may be with child. We call it rape. It's a terrible word. It has the note of a sword in it, a rapier. Rape! It almost rips the spirit when you say it. And if you've been a pastor or if you've counseled in crisis counseling, you know that there is hardly any pain of spirit that is harder to heal than the pain of a woman forced to a relationship by a thoughtless man. And then there is, on the other hand, a sensuous attitude that may get into the heart of a maiden and she may wish to sell her body for money or she may wish for some illicit moment of pleasure to find some back street or some dimly lit motel flea bag and there pour her body forth and give herself to something or to someone she will regret for later. It happens every day. And then she tries in the aftermath and in the afterglow of what was supposed to be real and beautiful to wash her body and wash her sins and hope to forget that it ever happened. But the fact is that very many of these children or maidens or young men find themselves caught in the trap of an elusive and a very hard to get hold of attitude that slips around and in and about and weaves itself through the inner cords of the attitude of youth and it's called lust. It just gets a hold of you. The Bible said flee youthful lusts which war against the soul. And by the time you try to put it away over here, it seems to crop up over there. And the natural force of the body creating chemical change and reaction in the body also creates a mindset that makes a wanting or a desiring or a wantonness until you want something or you want someone perhaps outside of the bonds of love. And when that happens, sometimes when the affair is over and sometimes when the deed is done and sometimes after you've showered and walked away and you feel like you've cleansed yourself, oh, what a horror to learn in a few days, in a few weeks that you actually carry in your body a lingering of that situation. It was not just a moment's pleasure. There was something in it that creates an eternal soul. And that's why the greatest moral issue in the world today, not just in America, is the killing of unborn babies. It becomes political issue. It becomes state issue and city issue and welfare issue. It becomes an issue for preachers. It becomes an issue for statesmen. Abortion. Killing the unborn child. A child that's not wanted. A baby that is produced as a result of relationship but was never intended to grow and was never intended to be by the partners. Everybody still here? These children are not children of love. Else the parents would want them to grow. They are not the product of certain and absolute surrender. They are in fact 
just the product of a physical or a chemical or a biological happening. And we wish it didn't happen. Sometimes in the spirit, we are involved in or induced to participate in some kind of mental or spiritual relationships with worldliness. And we wander sometimes the back streets of unbelief or lay in back dark alleys of doubt or crawl into a flea-bagged bed with all kinds of bitterness. And then we get back to the foot of the cross and bathe ourselves from that illicit relationship We've allowed our mind to think God doesn't care. We've allowed our mind to think that the people of God are not kind. We let ourselves get an attitude that people just don't care about me. Or we let ourselves get strung out on the kind of a spiritual philosophy that I really don't have to be so involved in religion or with Christ anyway. And whatever those illicit, idolatrous thoughts are, and whatever relationships they have, the Bible teaches us we need to bring into captivity every thought that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. If there is one traveling thought in our minds that gets out to have a relationship with doubt or fear or unbelief, we need to go now quickly into the recesses of our heart, get hold of that wandering spirit, bring it back into submission to the Holy Spirit of God. But what we fail to realize often is Though we cleanse ourselves in remorse from the deed and we say, I'm sorry I felt that way. Lord, forgive me. I didn't mean to act like that. Oh, God, would you please just put that all under the blood. Sometimes, though we repent for the deed and sometimes, though we ask forgiveness for the affair with spiritual ungodliness we do not realize that there has been bred into our nature the seed of a strange child Christians wonder why they have so much trouble with spirits Why are they always battling demonic force? Why can't we just rise up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and put these things away? We can. But we have a problem. We're dealing with the affair and not the seed. We deal with the situation and not the eternity of the affair. We are willing to pray for 15 minutes after the preacher preaches and say, oh God, don't let me have that, Jesus. Wash me in your blood, make me clean, and forget that our nature is being formed. Something is formed in us. When a woman has seed in her body, an embryo is formed. There are eyes and there are nails and there are bones formed in the womb. There is a formation that takes place in our illicit, illicit relationships with worldliness and ungodliness. And when you allow your mind to travel freely up and down the alleys of ungodliness, you are very likely to have formed in you. No matter how many times you scrub the affair, it's very possible that somewhere, someday, you may very well have a child. David didn't pray, rid me from strange women. And the Bible talks about strange women. About 60 times in the Old Testament, the word strange is used. 40 out of the 60 times, two-thirds of the time, it talks about strange gods, 
strange women, strange wives, or strange fire. Things that are absolutely anti-God. Two-thirds of the time the word strange is used in the Old Testament. It has something to do with things that are estranged from godliness. Everybody still here? David is trying to glorify God. Blessed be the Lord, my strength. I'm giving God the glory. He's my strength. And this is the situation we live in. I'm not preaching to sinners out on the corner. I'm not trying to convert the church down the street. I'm preaching to the folks who warm these padded pews in Truth Church today. You folks who sit in the perimeter of this building and hear the sound of my voice. And those of you who hear by tape or by some means somewhere else, some other time, I speak to you and tell you that there is an unearthly struggle that goes on in Christendom today. It is a war. Paul said he could see it even in his own members. A war. The spirit of man against the spirit of God. The flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And there is this warring and there is this fighting in man. He said, I see it in my members. It's there. It's in me. I know it's there. God spoke of Israel and her, her estrangement from him. He said, come back to me, Israel. I'm married to you. But the fact is that Israel wouldn't come back to God. Didn't come back to God. And the Lord spoke through Hosea and other of the prophets. Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken ye, house of Israel. Give ye ear, O you, house of kings, for judgment is toward you, because you have been a snare on Pisbah and a net to Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. They won't stop what they're doing long enough to turn to God. Say, well, he's just speaking. He's just talking to the nations. No, he's talking to Israel. And in spirit, he's talking to the church. I told you the other night, and you know what my point is. You know already what my point is. When I'm preaching this month, I'm coming to you directly. There is a curse in our churches today. And it is that we are all right we don't need anything. We got God somewhere back the road and we don't have to worry about ever needing anything else. Which precludes the fact that though we have found Him to be precious and though we know Him to be gracious and full of mercy and loving kindness, there is in the spirit of man that constant waywardness and that continual war and without the continuing of the blood and its, and its proficiency for us and its cleansing of us, we are going to be filthy. The church can get full of ungodliness. Well, there's no shouting about this, is there? And what's even meaner than that? is we lie to ourselves and we hide in our falsehoods. Our music is good, we hide in that. Our singing is great, we hide in that. Our preaching is terrific, we hide in that. Our church building is big, we hide in that. We got lots of folks who go to church, we hide in that. I belong to that church, we hide in that. I got saved 40 years ago. You can hide in any religious idea you want to. But the fact remains that now, before God, you stand or fall in the cleansing of the blood. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no remission of sin. 
Doesn't matter where you came from, what your spiritual pedigree is, who was your spiritual father in the Lord, how many years you've been in the ministry, how long you've talked in tongues, it doesn't matter to God. If right now your spirit is not pure and is not clean before God, you may be carrying in your body after you have born 100 precious children, you may carry a strange child. They won't frame their doings to turn unto their God. The spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them. They have not known the Lord. The word known here means to know as Adam knew his wife. They have not had a relationship with the Lord. Since they don't have a continual relationship with God, then they get wanton and they go have a relationship with the world. Since they don't pray, then they'll go gossip. Since they don't sing the songs of Zion, then they'll sing the honky-tonk songs and listen to the radio and the rock and roll. Come on, somebody say amen in the house. Since they don't lift up their heart and their spirit to the Lord God to give Him glory, then they find heroes in this world. On the football field, on the baseball field, and all over the country, they'll find something to worship. Come on, somebody could say amen. The fact is that we have all kinds of spirits in us. And just because we have one time had an experience with God does not exempt us from the fact that we may in our spirits have the embryo of some strange and worldly and ungodly and distasteful thing that needs to be purged out of us. How will you know if you never call for the cleansing of the blood? Or how will you know until someday you are great with that bitterness until it drops out into your arms? Something you've got to take care of the rest of your life. I've watched men go to the grave nurturing bitterness. They rear it. They feed it. They diaper it. They clothe it. They educate it. They confirm it. And they raise those strange ungodly spirits in their houses and in their bedrooms and in their kitchens and around their family tables. And in the foyers of churches they nurture such filthiness and never realize that the reason they don't praise God and the reason they don't give God glory is because they have never stopped in their overture or in their ode to graciousness long enough to sense that there is something unclean and filthy in me. And if he does not purge me, I may bear a child that is not clean. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. They'll go to church. Yes, sir going to go to church, be like everybody else, do what they've done for the last several years. They're going to go right along with the same routine. But when they come, what do you mean with their flocks and with their herds? Why would you go to church with your flocks or herds? Because that was their force of sacrifice. Sure, they came with their calves. They came with their lambs. They came with their songs. They came with their music. They came with all their singing. They came with all their special arts. They came with their instruments. They came with their flocks and their herds. They came with their worshiping, you know, paraphernalia. But the scripture says that when they got there, they found him not. He had withdrawn himself. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Oh, yeah. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment. Why do people not know what's right and wrong? Why the struggle in a church where we are given the liberty to seek the Lord and to know him? Is everybody still here? This is not simple for me to preach anymore. It is for you to hear. Why in a church where there is given liberty for you to seek after the Lord and to find the Lord and to do what is pleasing in the sight of the Lord, why would there be a remaining and a continual and a constant wonder? What should I do? Where should I go? Can I do these things? Can I do that? Can I be this way? Can I be that way? What is this troubled water? What are these many waters that I'm caught in? Why do I live my life in spiritual misunderstanding? I don't know whether to go or whether to come. I don't know whether I can do that or whether I can do this. The fact is that I have in fact become as Ephraim who is oppressed. I've got an oppression on me. I don't think that the devil possesses completely and totally the Christian. I don't believe in the devil possession 
of Christians. I'm just going to tell you that honestly, and I disagree with a lot of people in here on that. But I'm going to tell you, I believe that for one to be possessed of the devil, he has totally and completely given over his house to Satan. And Satan becomes the goodman of the house, and he is Lord of the house. I believe that it's possible to be oppressed, depressed, suppressed, and pressed. <clears throat> and there's any question that the devil can affect what you think and what you do and where you go. And he can have an, a, a complete spell on you and have you following his trait and his path and all of that. But I believe that the Christian, one time he ever becomes possessed of the devil... I don't believe he's possessed of Christ. The Bible said that he will not live in an unclean temple. And I don't believe the Lord's going to stay there as the Lord of that house or as the inhabitor of that house with the devil in there. He said, well, they've got spirits. What you're really saying is that they have in the womb of their heart the embryo of some unclean thing. Because of a relationship that that Christian has had with worldliness or with unbelieving thought or with ungodly attitude. There is growing in the spirit of that Christian something that's going to be a strange child. Strange to what? Strange to prayer. It's strange to worship. It's strange to love each other. It's strange to feed the poor. It's strange to love your neighbor. It's strange to weep over a world in China or India or wherever you have not seen. That's strange to these kind of spirits because when these little young'uns pop out of the womb and into your arms and you start taking care of them, they'll say, hey, you don't need to do that and you don't have to go to church and you don't need to pray and you don't need to be in a prayer room and that preacher's goofy anyway and I don't like the music, it's too loud and it will criticize everything that has anything to do with godliness. Or the direction of righteousness. Because they're strange children. <laughs> what shall we say of those who refuse consecration? What shall we say of men and women, young men, young ladies, who hear sermons but never act to purge their hearts. What shall we say of those who cannot be renewed in their minds and in their hearts? The Bible says don't be conformed to the world. Don't be like the world. Be transformed. How can you be transformed? By the renewing of your mind. What shall we say of folks who never deal with their mind? who let their thoughts run around like wild little banshees, who never one time put a bridle or a halter on their creative thinking. You can get to thinking after a while that somebody doesn't like you. They've never spoken to you, against you, or anything. You just start thinking it. They don't like me. After a while you say, she didn't speak to me. Well, she didn't even see you. And then you can get to saying, I'll tell you what, I don't like her either. And you know what's happening? The fetus is growing. Your spirit is nurturing something in the womb of your spirit. And it's feeding it. And the blood flow that ought to be worship and glory to God, part of it goes to bitterness. And what ought to be feeding a good strength to go out and do the work of God, part of it's feeding that little bitterness down there. And boy, the first thing you know, you've got your little diapered baby running around after you. And every time the rest of your life you try to do something for God or to love people. You'll never trust anybody. Have you ever listened to that little baby chatter? I've learned not to trust people. That's that little embryo you nurture. That's that little fetus you let grow. And when it comes time to worship the Lord, we say, let's all worship the Lord. Ah, oh, God, I, well, we're going to stand up again. That's that little brat you've been raising. Say, we're going to have fasting and prayer this week. And we are. We're going to be here in prayer every evening. And the church is open all night long. There'll be people here in prayer all night long and all day long. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday. Up till Thursday night service. 
We're going to take communion together and we're going to see if we can remember each other again. Put each other back together. Hallelujah. We're going to seek the face of our God until he come and rain righteousness on us. I'm telling you, just to climb into that prayer room and take a little spiritual shower after the sermon doesn't wash away the seed. We need a spiritual operation. We need God to get a hold of those little things following us around and pick out what's righteous and what's unrighteous. And if you can't make up your mind which one you want to raise, then you need to say, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but somewhere my judgment and my oppression is muddled. Ephraim is oppressed and broken. This is what oppression always does. It breaks your judgment. I don't know what to do because you've got too many little voices pulling on you. Feed me. I'm hungry. I don't have any shoes. And by the time you get through with all those little spirits pulling on you, you don't know which way to go. That's why people stop attending the house of the Lord. That's why people stop giving the Lord their finance. That's, it's, it's not just... It's not other things that seem to be so superfluous and so simple. Oh, no, no. No, no. It's something they've nurtured a long, long time. It's something they got in there and got a hold of. They showered off over that one little situation and said, well, I'm through that. I, I, I've forgotten all about that and that doesn't bother me anymore. But they didn't have a heart operation. They didn't get the seed. David didn't pray, oh, God, forgive me for this terrible spiritual affair I've been through. Oh, God, forgive me for what I've done in my worldly thinking. No, no. He said, I want you to get rid of the kids. Deliver me from strange children. Something actually was produced by that relationship. Something that lives and breathes and is as real as my spirit itself. What happens <clears throat> is that it becomes convenient for us to become strangers to righteousness. People can actually speak against the Word of God and feel justified. I know what the Bible says, but I'm just going to tell you, I just can't stand it anyhow. I know what the Bible says, but what is that? Where did that come from? Where, where did we ever get the audacity to say, I know what God says, but I think. I know what God says, but I feel. I know what they said. I know they said they forgive me, but I, uh, I, I just don't think they ever got rid of it. And I just personally just can feel every time I get around them like I'm just, I just feel terrible. See what happened? We just get rid of the little affair, but we're raising some child somewhere, some spiritual baby of bondage, some spiritual child of oppression. That's what Abraham did. Man, God spoke to him and said, I'm going to give you a son. You're going to be the father of nations. Marvelous. Isn't that great? And the Bible says, to make it even sweeter, that Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. He's going to have seed. He's going to bear a child. Oh, wonderful. And so, as years go by, and time moves along, and questions arise, and physical and personal wonder and misunderstanding, or lack of knowledge in a situation, Abraham wasn't trying to just do bad he wasn't just sitting over lusting after Hagar. Bible doesn't say so. No, he loves Sarah. But here's a situation where in an effort to do the work of God and in an effort to help God out. Okay? Where'd everybody go? Everybody here? Folks in the balcony, you up there? In an effort to help God out, 
Actually, it was Sarah who says, why don't you take my handmaid, Hagar, and bear a son by her? And so the Bible said that Hagar had a son and they called his name Ishmael. Sweet little fella, Ishmael. I hate to tell you, Abe, but you got a strange young in there. You got a strange child. Oh, I got me a boy. <laughs> yeah, I got me a boy. Sure do. And then here comes Isaac. Lo and behold, Isaac is born. Boy, this is something, isn't it now? Now I got me two boys. And the Bible says that Abraham loved Ishmael. Then it says that Abraham circumcised his son Isaac. And then it says that Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, mocking. I'm going to say that word again. Mocking. If you want to know whether or not you've got a strange child in your house, I'll tell you what it does. It talks back to spirituality. It makes fun of worship. It makes light of prayer. It tries to steal and harden mercy. It tries to overcome. It tries to outdo and suppress righteousness. And the scripture says when Sarah saw the Egyptian's boy, Ishmael, mocking, she said to Abraham, cast out this bond woman. When she talked to her the first time, she said, she's my maid. But when you finally have a child by that kind of a spirit, she becomes a bond woman. And that's what we do with worldliness and ungodliness. It's all just a little servant to please us. As long as we are just having a little spiritual affair, nothing should be said. It's my business where I go. It's my business what I look at. It's my business what I wear. Sure it is. I just want to inform you that when you have an affair with worldly lusts, that somewhere in that little flea bag motel, after you get through with your little shower at the cross, there may be in your heart the seed of something you can't just so easily dispose of. It may hang on you for years. You may struggle with it for all your life. To this very moment, Hagar's boy is sitting perched on the hills of Goland. He is standing in Syria. He is in Libya. He is a terrorist. He is bloodthirsty. He does not care for human life. After these four millenniums, he is still a ruthless cutthroat. He hates God's people. And Sarah knew what had to be done. She said, cast out this bondwoman and her son. We don't need just a little superfluous repentance. What the church needs today is a downright gut-wrenching Holy Ghost revival that gets into our spirit and changes our mind and changes our lives. We've played too many games at Calvary 
we've turned the knob of rusty nails and waited for the little splashing shower of the blood. And if we can scrub our exterior epidermis, we think we're okay. The church needs a downright heart look. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. You might get rid of the woman and have the baby. And David said, deliver me of strange children. That's why God spoke to his prophets many times. He said to Saul by Samuel, utterly, not just a little bit, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. You don't really mean utterly, I mean utterly, all together. And their husbands and their wives and their sucklings and their babies. That's what he said. Because of what they did to my people when they were coming up from Egypt, when they stood in the way, because they did not submit to my people, because they didn't surrender to my people and, and to my cause. I want you to go. I don't want you just to take Amalek and get rid of Agag. Don't just go kill the king. Don't just go knock down their courthouse. I want you to go and get every soul of them. I want their oxen. I want their camels. I want their sheep. I want their goats. I want their heifers. I want everything that lives and breathes that looks like Amalek. I want it dead. I'm telling you that revival, revival, pure revival, is something that this 20th century church knows so little about. There's so much worldliness we still like. So many things in our spirit we can qualify. Well, I know I need to get right, but I'll tell you there are a few things I just don't feel too bad about. Just because we feel something. just Abraham felt something too. The Bible said he loved Ishmael. And his heart was broken for Ishmael. He said, it is my son. And God took care of Ishmael in a desert simply because it was the seed of Abraham. But Abraham spawned something and bred something and created something that will haunt his race forever. And the Bible refers back to that in the book of Galatians. And it says, this Mount Sinai gendereth to bondage. And it is Hagar, these two mountains, Sinai and Jerusalem, or Sinai and Zion, are like these two spirits, Hagar and Sarah. The seed of the bondwoman is Sinai. It's the law. It's bondage. It gendereth to bondage. When it has a youngin, it'll be bondage. It gendereth. Let's all say gendereth. When it has children, it'll be bondage. But this Jerusalem which is above us is free, which is the mother of us all. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, some of the most glorious writing of all the Bible. We are not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. If so be that even a beast come to it and touch it, it shall die. No, he went on to say we are come to Mount Zion. Hallelujah. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. And to the God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men. Come on, help me now. Made perfect. This new Jerusalem spirit is a spirit that does not allow imperfection in the spirit. We're always going to be imperfect in the flesh. But in my spirit and in my attitude and in my motives and in my heart and in my mind and in my life, there is a spirit of God that gendereth to liberty. 
everything that's born of it is free. It's pure. It's righteousness. It's joy in the Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to shout hallelujah. This glorious liberty that we have in God is supposed to take us out of illicit relationships and ungodly affairs. Jesus Christ is supposed to become the lover of the church and the church is supposed to be his wife and she's supposed to be pure and without spot and without blemish. Hallelujah! It's not supposed to be a whoring church. It's not supposed to be playing and dabbling in iniquity. The church is to be holy and righteous and pure and clean before God. What a marvelous opportunity we have. We don't have to live with a bondwoman's children all our lives. I'm telling you, you can make a trip to Calvary and you're not going to be doing something bad nor hurting society for God to reach into your spirit and to pull out of it the fetus of unbelief. God needs to wrench off of us and out of us and out of our arms the spirit of these strange, unparticipating children. Let's all stand, shall we? This new covenant, this grace of God will perform an operation, the Bible says, on your heart. The operation of God through the Spirit. You don't have to raise that child. You don't have to raise that attitude. You can live for God in harmony and peace and happiness. You don't have to be tortured every mile of your Christian journey. That's right. Because we've come to the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And to the innumerable company of angels. There are angels sitting around watching this operation. They marvel because they can't even understand it. Never happened to them. They've never felt redemption's glowing touch. Never, not one time. The angels that fell will never be redeemed. In the darkness of their pit there are no altars. In the horror of their loneliness there is no bloodshed. They are chained under everlasting darkness under the judgment of the great day. Why, church, why should we live in the great waters? And why should we be distressed every moment? Because oppression has broken judgment. And we don't know what's right from wrong. We don't know what's good or bad. The Bible said to the prophet, if you'll separate the precious from the vile, you can speak as my mouth. If you'll get busy and take the strange children and say, I've got an attitude in me that doesn't like to come to church. And I make up my mind every Thursday night that I'm not going to be there and I'm just not going to go. If something's announced, prayer and fasting, I'm not going to be involved. I can pray at home. That's not what we said we were going to do. We said we were going to come here to the house of the Lord. Bring our children and bring our babies. We're going to come in here in the evening time. 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Some of us all through the night. We said we were going to fast. Said we weren't going to eat. What is that little spirit that says, hey, I don't have to do that. I don't believe fasting does any good anyway. Where did you get that little unbelief young Where would that little unbelief young and come from? That's the same spirit that says, well, I, I'd call the church, but there's news to call the church. You know, we call for prayer. Nothing ever happens anyway. Let's just go down here and get some medicine get it over with. Who said the prayer of faith doesn't heal the sick? I'm trying to believe that. I believe that. I've got to believe that in my mind right now. I've got to believe that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Hallelujah. 
what is that little non-participating spirit? If everybody else is going to do it, I'm not going to. What is that spirit of giving that holds back or that cheats? That's the same spirit that it's, it's, it's the same spirit that cheats on income tax. We treat God like the government. Sure. If we can get by with it, who cares? God who? I never realize that He's a real and a living God. That we are real and living people. Now, to close all of this, I want to go back just one more time to the psalm of my text. And I want to tell you why David said he wanted the strange children gone. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity. In their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. They're hiding in religious lies. They're saying everything's okay when everything's not okay. They're saying you're all right when you're not all right. You're saying, well, I think it'll be okay when you know it's not okay. It's blowing judgment to pieces in your life. It's destroying righteous judgment in your heart. First thing you know, you won't know what's right or wrong. There won't be any line of righteousness. Because righteousness is going to be laid to the line. Judgment's going to be laid to the line. And righteousness to the plummet. And here I want to get rid of these strange children whose mouths speak vanity and they're always lying to me about my soul. They're always telling me fibs about my spiritual condition. I can always find a reason for not worshiping. I can ask one of these little strange children and they'll always tell me I don't need to be in church and they'll always tell me I don't have to love anybody and they'll always tell me that the poor doesn't need me and they'll always tell me that the church is going down and they'll always tell me all kinds of things that are not true. But if I can get rid of strange children, my sons will grow up as plants, grown up in their youth that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. <laughs> Rid me of strange children. I repented for the affair. But somewhere deep in my spirit, I carry the seed of unbelief. Or I carry the seed of doubt. Or I live with fear. Or I allow oppression. Rid me. Whatever it takes, rid me. Whatever it takes, rid me. This is something I can't just get washed. One time he said, wash me with clean water. Another time he said, purge me with hyssop. This time he just says a word that just you can hear it rip. Rid me. Rid me of strange children. Rid me. Rid me of strange children. Rid me of strange children. Oh God. Oh God, I rebuke oppression. I rebuke the oppression that crowds and crouches and bears its fangs and growls and frightens the Christians. Oh God, I stand against fear and doubt and unbelief. All manner of spirits of bitterness, anxiety, mistrust, unrest filthiness, uncleanness, 
I come against disease and affliction. I come against all of these spirits that bind people, the people of God. Now, Lord, I pray that you will release the people of the Lord today to a heart search. Release them to a soul purging. Somehow give spiritual direction and impetus toward a renovation of mind and heart. Don't let us stay as we are. Don't let us be what we've always been. Oh God, rid us of strange children. In Jesus' name. can hear the weeping of the Spirit. Almost like the wrenching of the heart. Speak to us, O God. Confirm Your Word today, Lord. O Jesus. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord. O Jesus. O Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, la casita la morondo, yo, rondo, no, 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 no. Oh, Jesus. Hear you, my people, today. Why do I weep? Why do I cry? For you have set aside and said, I seek the Lord. I look for God. But I tell you, you're selfish. You're selfish. For you say, I will give this, but not that. I will go this far. But this is not required. I, God does not require this of my hand. But in a marriage... What does the husband require of the wife? Or the wife require of the husband? Nothing. Except that the other one freely and with great desire gives themselves to each other. My cry against you today is because you are selfish. And if you will know me and know truth and be builded upon this foundation, and build up an habitation for me, then have put away your selfishness. I have brought you out again, and again, and again. And today I have brought you to this place again. And you always say, I'm going to do better tomorrow. But when tomorrow comes, it's just the same as today. And I want you to know that even though you try to hide in the shadow, you always find me there. And I, I am today begging you to come unto me. Yes, he is. There is a weeping in the Spirit today. It's a weeping in the heart of God. <clears throat> there has been all through this week. I want to... Uh, I, I want to say to you, that while we stand and wait for God to speak to that other person, the church, as a church, will never move. Only we, as people of God, will move in that body. If you're waiting for the church to sweep you along in a tide of revival, that's not going to happen. If you have revival, you'll have it. And not that other person God is speaking to. If you have a real awakening, you'll have it. And not that other person that you think God is dealing with. What we need to do today is we need to examine our hearts. 
And then after you've examined your heart, realize that you don't even know what's in your heart. You know what I've come to believe? Through pastoring and preaching, I've come to believe as I have preached to people for years and years and watched their unrestrained spiritual rebellion and watched their untrained and unharnessed religious ambition just move haywire when conviction doesn't move the heart when the Holy Ghost doesn't change the mind I'm convinced that these people do not really know there's anything wrong convinced of that and if there's nothing wrong, then why should I pray? And if there's nothing wrong, why should I be changed? If there's nothing wrong, why should I respond? You understand what I'm saying? So since there's nothing wrong, really we don't ever need any preaching. We really don't ever need any conviction. Because if I don't open the door to God and say, Search me, God. You try me. The ways of man are not in himself to direct his paths. I don't even know what's in my heart. I don't even know what's in my mind. Only God knows. I've got to give him the opportunity to cleanse me. If that's your prayer, I'd like you to hold your hands up to the Lord. You cleanse me, O oh God. And pray that prayer to the Lord right where you stand if you really mean that. I don't even know what's in my heart, Lord. You cleanse me, Lord. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Oh God. Oh God. I've, I've said all I can say practically today. I just want to, I just want to say this last thought to you. It is imperative for revival's sake and for the harvest that we be renewed. We will not participate in the great revival in our present state of spiritual mind. This church will not see the great revival. If we don't renew. God has promised us that we will see it. God has promised us that we'll possess it. But he told Abraham that too. And then sent him off walking. And we've got to go possess this land that God's promised us. It's got to begin with the renewing of our mind. I couldn't preach all of the detail of things. It works everywhere from I'm not going to sing in the choir anymore to I, I just don't feel like praying. Oppression is a thief of desire. Let me say that to you again. Oppression is the thief of desire. He steals desire. You don't feel like praying. You don't feel like worshiping. You don't feel like praising. You don't feel like going an extra night to pray. You don't feel like... Why not? What are all these other people so excited about? Where did all my desire go? Oppression got it. My strange children are gobbling it all up. They're taking my life's strength. What ought to give me joy? What ought to give me energy? What ought to give me courage? I don't ever get. Because these children, these strange children get it. 
If God has spoken to your heart, I invite you tonight to seek the face of the Lord with me and to pray. Before you leave the pew you're sitting on or standing in, would you please greet friends or folks you may not have met before or visitors and invite them to come with you to pray. There'll be ministry here around the front for those who need to be healed in your body or in your spirit. There'll be someone waiting to help you if you need repentance. Most of all, the church is praying for revival. For I would say unto you, my children, say yes, Lord. Say yes. For behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And I would say if you would reach out. And open that door. That I was come in. Don't clean house before you open the door. Because it takes me to come through that door. Say yes. Open the door. Open the door. And I will come in and I will sup with you. And you will be mine. And I I will cleanse the house. He come up, Shantaya. And the illumining light from my word this day, as you open that door, will shine into the dark areas of every hidden storeroom of thy heart. And it will illumine that place, and it will be, bring life. And even though some things cannot live in light, you will see these things curl up before your eyes as dirty, filthy things that cannot stand the light. And they will be scraped clean from your walls. And I will take the moss and the algae and the things that you have let grown in your heart and I will cleanse them. Let the light of this word, for I have brought you revelation today. You did not know what was hidden in your heart. You did not know what was binding your steps you did not know why you were stumbling you did not know why your hands seemed to have mittens on them until you could pick up no truth you did not know why your eyes seemed dim and yet today through my servant I have given you illumination and if you will open that door even as I have spoken to thee and let the light of my understanding flood your soul today I will destroy yea destroy every filthy, rotten thing that you have let into your storehouse and I will flood your soul with my presence and you will know a joy you have not known and I will restore unto thee the joy of thy salvation and I will put a spring in thy faltering steps and you will leap upon the mountains and you will sing with the angels songs that they have to stand back and listen yea I will do this thing unto thee but open that door that my light which has come in just a filtering through the keyhole will flood in and destroy and cleanse and clean and reestablish yea renew thee saith the Lord now let's lift our hands up to the Lord, shall we, and surrender. We thank you for your word, O oh Lord God. And as your hands are lifted up and the Spirit of the Lord speaks to you, just step out of your seat and let's make our way here all around the front and fill the prayer room full. Bring your friends and neighbors with you. Let's come out of the balcony. Find your way to either side stairway and down the response stairs.
Let us seek the Lord until He come and rain righteousness on us. If you're visiting with us today, come and pray with us. You know you've heard the voice of the Lord.